So my grandfather fought in World War II, uh, so that was a that was a big deal. And then I had an uncle of mine that was a Vietnam veteran, did three years there, and and he was my hero, uh, my uncle Bobby, you know. And um, so I was that ten year old kid running around reading Soldier Fortune magazines, you know what I mean, and Ranger and all this hook, line, and sinker, man. Like I bought it all, I loved it. So that's all I ever wanted to do was was join the military. That was my motivation for coming in was these role models that I had in my life and you know and who I wanted to be like. And uh, and then once I got into the military, I found out it was it was my thing. In 1990, uh, Gulf War had kicked off when I was at basic training. Uh, joined the 82nd uh, Airplane Gang and then uh, deployed to Saudi Arabia. So I was. Uh, right from the get-go, you know what I mean, thrown into combat, you know, as someone fresh off the street. Um, had huge impact on my life. Spent uh, five years from 90 to 95 and, and in the 82nd. Uh, from there, I went to uh, Special Forces in 96. I uh, went to the Q course and then was assigned as an 18 Charlie to 7th Special Forces Group, which uh, worked at Central and South America, deployed in all different countries down there, uh, being a teacher. And I really enjoy teaching, pretty good at it. I learned a lot during that time. Then September of 2001, I went to selection and got selected to go out to Delta. And then uh, from 2001 until 2011, I spent my time as an operator out at Delta. I did 12 rotations uh, while I was there. Uh, so basically all my 30s. That was the kind of my path, you know, as it was just about hey, do I have what it takes to be at the next level? I didn't think that I did on some occasions, especially making it in the unit. I was just going because I didn't want the regret of not giving it a shot. Do I have what it takes? You know what I mean? And, and being tested, you know what I mean? And the competition, you know what I mean? It was just the whole lifestyle. It just fit. And I made it. At the end of that career, you know, uh, and all those deployments and everything, I mean, I was, I was burnt out. I was still fully capable and, uh, so my experience level, I was at the top of my game because of, you know what I mean, all the gunfights, all the hits, you know what I mean, very, you know, masterful in the stuff that we were doing. But there's a cost to that on the humanness, you know, and, and no one can evade that. You know, ultimately trained to do all of it, embraced it and everything, but the human factor, uh, you know what I mean, of all that, that we did, you know, there was a toll. Started lo losing a lot of abilities, like uh, I didn't know how to get back to my house. You know, be driving down the road like, and not know where I'm at. But in typical our my type guys of fashion is, uh, well, just keep going, you'll figure it out. You know what I mean? And I'll recognize something in a minute. In the Civil War time, you know, they called it soldier's heart. In uh, World War One, you know what I mean? In, in two kind of time frame, it was shell shock. Oh, they got shell shock. And then it was battle fatigue. That was a big one, Vietnam time. So it was all the same events, human beings be involved in in combat. And uh, all of these are references to what we now call PTSD. But the big thing with all that was, is it let me know that, uh, that I wasn't crazy. Because I figured like, okay, I'm losing it. It's like, no, I'm not losing it. Just got something wrong. You know, it just happens to be my brain, not my shoulder. You know what I mean? And uh, the cool thing is, I mean, went to cognitive therapy, vestibular therapy, psychological therapy. I mean, all these different things that helped me get better. Uh, and it all worked. You know, I mean, that stuff works, you know. So that got me uh, my transition out of the military, you know, and then out of the military uh, through my own experiences, what I was exposed to during all those times. I was like, hey, here's me, you know, I mean, fr a guy from the unit, a good reputation, um, all this support, and it was super hard. So that really got into my mind, you know, of like, man, this, you know, how do we, how do we help with this? If you wanted to set a warrior up for success of going to combat, succeeding in combat, and then uh, transitioning out of combat, uh, I had it all. On the warrior side, any and every training that was available, I was in. The amount of experience, you know, I mean, it's completely honed and experienced for war fighting, you know, and uh, so check on that for success. And then my, the other aspects, you know, my family life, I mean, my wife and I have been married for almost 24 years now. Incredible family life. You know what I mean? So on the family side, hugely supportive and incredible family. 
Um, so on that that venue was covered. You know, on the spiritual side, I mean, God of my understanding, you know what I mean? I have a relationship, you know what I mean? I have a huge support group, huge amount of friends. So on the social and the personal side, completely set up for success. So with all of that, you know what I mean? Warrior home, family completely good. Um, spiritually, you know what I mean, good. I tanked. Yeah. I mean, like, all the way to the point where it would have been just fine if I blew my head off. So when I, we start talking about 22 veteran suicides a day, like, yeah, I was almost one of those. And that's not just saying it. So that, you know what I mean, knowing and having lived through all that, then the other thing was is, hey, what about the guys that don't have the family? Don't have, uh, I'm not pushing spirituality or religion on anybody or anything, but they don't have anything greater grounded than what they were in, you know? Those are the guys that make up the 22 suicides a day. And that's a real number. You know, so it's like, hey, we need to do more. What is the role of the warrior in a time of peace? Check on, like, in time of war, got it. You know what I mean? Hey, we can do that and do it well. But what do I do, you know what I mean, or warriors do when it's a time of peace, you know? And, and that's teach, you know, and provide guidance and instruction, mainly for our own. Once I graduated, you know, in my, in my TBI program and uh, all that stuff, I, I wasn't that screwed up anymore, um, but I was far from being okay. You know, I mean, I'm a lot of progress, but there was this big gap of, okay, you're not so screwed up that you have to be hospitalized. Because, I mean, as problem solvers, like we do, it's like, where are the gap? You know, we're always looking for oddities. We're always, you know, what doesn't fit? It's like, okay, there's a gap that needs to be filled. And, uh, and I was working a lot with Magnus at the time. You know, he had just gotten out, and we were kind of, just Forrest Gumping our way through this stuff, you know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, Tom, here's the path to success and, you know, a 501c3 and what you should know, you know, and it was, uh, so Magnus and I, you know I mean? We, we came up with these processes that we do, you know, and uh, a lot of it's the healing aspects of it, you know, how does that occur? So we came up with Elder Heart and the mission of Elder Heart is uh, warriors, helping warriors through community projects. There's no silver bullet, but a big thing that adds to that, that number of suicides is the gap between the veteran uh, and the community. There's millions of great Americans that are just like, I want to help, but I don't know how. I mean, so we had to provide, our responsibility to provide an answer like, hey, this is how you can help. The medium that we use through that on Elder Heart is, uh, is a community art projects. And it's not just veterans doing an art piece. Because again, that doesn't help with the divide. I mean, how can we be a part of this, you know? So uh, on the veteran side, like you can't help veterans uh, but like myself and, and others like me by saying, hey man, you're all screwed up and we're here to help. You'll be like, yeah, keep your pity, I'm good. But what you do is you say, hey man, we need you to help these other veterans and they'll be there in a heartbeat. You know what I mean? Because that's how we're, we're built. And with the community, a lot of times, and we've heard this from, from certain members of the community, you know, as, as a whole, is, is that uh, they're kind of scared. And I don't mean like fearful of us, but like, uh, it's kind of awkward. Like, what do we talk about? What to do? You know, and that kind of stuff. So, again, that everybody working and lifting and making sandwiches and, I mean, it's, uh, you know, just a grassroots American way of doing things, you know, uh, not looking to government to solve our problems. They've got enough stuff they're trying to handle. It's like, hey, how do we fill this gap? You know, and we do it the old fashioned American way <laughs> ourselves.